Stone Brothers Production. Hello, welcome back to the Serial Killer series. Today, me and my brother will be talking about eight serial killers in Indiana. Number eight, Howard Allen. Allen's victims were all elderly people near his hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana. In August of 1974, at the age of 24 years old, he invaded the home of his first victim, 85-year-old Opal Cooper. Allen beat her to death during a petty robbery and was convicted on a reduced charge of manslaughter. He received a prison term of 2 to 21 years. He was released on parole on January of 1985. On May 18, 1987, he went on to his next victim assaulting her in her home, but she survived. On May 20th of 1987, Allen assaulted Laverne Hale, age 87, being his second murdered victim after dying nine days later. Almost two months later, on July 14th, 1987, Allen burglarized the Indianapolis home of 73-year-old Ernestine Griffin. He then stabbed her eight times with a 10-inch butcher knife and then repeatedly smashing a kitchen toaster against her skull, killing her. He was caught on August 4th, 1987 after being charged with one of his multiple murders. On spring of 1988, Allen was convicted of burglary and a felony battery that he committed back in May 18th. Also, he got an additional count of habitual criminal behavior and was sentenced with those convictions to 88 years in prison. On June 11th, 1988, Allen was convicted of the brutal murder and robbery of Griffin back in July of 1987. Allen was sentenced to death the same day and he had been on death row ever since. Number 7. Anna Cunningham Cunningham was a poisoner of her family to collect insurance money. She committed five murders from 1918 to 1922 in Lake County, Indiana. Anna, her husband, and her multiple children lived on a farm in Batchley Corners, Indiana. In 1919, her husband experienced intense stomach pains and died after suffering days of severe illness. She collected $1,000 of insurance money from her husband's death and the family moved to Gary, Indiana. A year later, one of her kids, Isabella, age 28, died the same way. She collected another $1,000 of insurance money five weeks after her death. In 1921, her third victim was her 18-year-old son, Charles, who died the same way, and she got his insurance money of $850. Her next victim was her 23-year-old son, Harry, who died on October 18, 1921. After less than a year, she got $2,500 from his insurance. Her last confirmed murder was her youngest son, Walter, who died in 1922, being insured with only $180. The last victim she tried poisoning and killing was her last boy, David Jr., who was taken to the Gary Hospital. Fortunately, he survived and he was partially paralyzed, but he was gradually recovering. After this, the bodies were all exhumed with their organs being tested, confirming it was parasite, and she was soon arrested after on April 11th, 1925. Later after her arrest, she confessed of her crimes, saying she loved them and she wanted them to join the Father in Heaven. She stated she had taken poison in hopes of joining them, too. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole for one count of murder in 1925. Number 6. David Most, aka Crazy Dave. David was born in Connellsville, Pennsylvania in 1954. David was confined in a mental institution at the age of 9 from the request of his mother. She requested this because she claimed David set fire to his younger brother's bed and later tried drowning him. However, his mother was mentally ill and was diagnosed psychotic in a mental hospital she stayed at. David left at the age of 13 from the mental hospital to a children's home because of his mother not wanting him. He was molested there by another boy. It was rumored as a kid he choked two of his friends for no reason. When David was a young adult, he worked in construction for his uncle in Georgia and was a pretty skilled worker there. Unfortunately, David was fired from the company after crashing the company truck. David tried returning to his mother but she didn't want him to return and she took him to an army recruiter. In 1971, at the age of 18, David joined the army and he was stationed in 1972 in Frankfurt, Germany after he completed his training. He was a very good bowler in his army league, averaging scores as high as 297 and he won many prizes and awards. In 1974, while still stationed in Germany, David killed a 13-year-old boy, James McClister. David was convicted of manslaughter and larceny from the army court-martial and was sentenced to four years in prison at Fort Leavenworth. He requested to not be paroled, but was released in 1977 despite his request. David was tried for an attempted murder in 1979 at his Chicago apartment for stabbing his friend while he was sleeping. On August 9th of 1981, he stabbed and drowned 15-year-old Donald Jones in Elgin, Illinois. He then moved to Texas a little after and stabbed a child in Galveston County, Texas on December 10th, 1981. He was sentenced to five years in prison for that crime, but he was extradited in 1982 to Illinois for the Jones murder charge. 
On May 6, 1994, David was sentenced to 35 years in prison with 11 credits time served already. In 1999, David was paroled after only 5 years in prison. On December 12, 2003, David was arrested for strangling to death 16-year-old James Ragani. His body was found encased in concrete in David's basement in Hammond, Indiana. David was charged with two more murders of 13-year-old Michael Dennis and 19-year-old Nick James in his basement. They were both found similarly wrapped in plastic and encased in concrete. In November of 2005, he pleaded guilty for the three murders in Indiana and he was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole. On January 20, 2006, David Moss committed suicide by hanging himself from twisted bed sheets in his jail cell. Number 5. Orville Majors Majors was a former licensed practical nurse from Clinton, Indiana. First suspicions developed when many deaths started occurring in Vermilion County Hospital where he worked. The average death toll was 25 dying annually before he started working there. After Majors started working at the hospital, the death toll skyrocketed to 100 per year, nearly one out of three patients going into the hospital dying. After the state of Indiana started a criminal investigation, Majors was arrested on December of 1987. It was believed that his method of murdering was injecting potassium chloride in his patients. Majors' license was suspended in 1985 after his arrest. He was believed to have committed as many as 130 murders between 1983 to 1995. In October of 1989, Majors was found guilty of murdering six patients and he was sentenced to 360 years in prison. Majors died almost 18 years later while in prison from heart failure on September 24, 2017. Number 4. Darren Vaughn Vaughn was born in Indiana but didn't stay there his whole life. Records, for instance, showed he was arrested on unspecified charges while living in Cherry Point, North Carolina in 1993. Vaughn went on to marry his first and only wife in 1990s. She had been 30 years older than him, and her son, Matthew Matlock, didn't feel safe around Vaughn when his kids were nearby. Matlock stated Vaughn would talk to himself or seem to be lost in thought. Matlock said things went downhill after Vaughn lost his job from a temp agency, adding that he had trouble finding decent work after that due to his previous records in the past. Matlock saw that him and his mother lived in poverty and decided to move his mother from Austin to Gary, Indiana. Vaughn had his first major brush with the law in April 2004 with a woman who wasn't Matlock's mother, who police described as Vaughn's girlfriend. He was arrested for threatening to burn down a man's house, then grabbed his supposed girlfriend and threatened to kill her and himself. He was charged with a Class D felony and spent 90 days behind bars after his conviction. After his release, Vaughn went back to Austin where in December 2007 he was arrested again, this time for aggravated sexual assault. The woman who was raped was responding with a service call from her employer when Vaughn met up with her and went up to her apartment where he attacked and raped her. He pleaded guilty and was convicted to a five-year prison sentence, which he was released on July 5, 2013 at that time. His wife also divorced him while he was staying in prison after being with him for 16 years she knew he was not good news. He was caught and registered as a sex offender in prison, then told officials he had moved back to Gary, Indiana. He was looked at as a minimal risk sex offender, which is based on experts' assessment of the likelihood that a person would commit another sexual offense. After his release, he went on a rape killing spree and started with Africa Hardy, who is a recent graduate from high school. She met Vaughn at a Motel 6 in Hammond, Indiana after he hired her through an escort agency. She had sex with him until it turned rough, and Vaughn strangled her with an extension cord he had brought with him. Her body was thrown into a bathtub, and he threw used condoms all over her body and fled the scene. He went on, raped, and killed six more women, leaving their bodies in abandoned buildings around the area of Gary, Indiana. Some of his victims were mothers, one being a mother of four and was employed. Others were crackheads and streetwalkers. Investigators used Hardy's phone records and located Vaughn being on that list. Vaughn was also found to have several key pieces of potential evidence, one including Hardy's phone. He pleaded not guilty for two charges of murder. After a few trial delays, he was charged with the murder and the deaths of five additional victims. 
the death penalty is being sought for each victim. He is also charged with bodily waste for allegedly throwing a carton of urine and feces at a Lake County correctional officer at the jail he was held at. Now they are going back and forth on the death penalty. Jury selection will be going on in September 2018, and the trial will begin on October 2018 for what Vaughn will be charged with. Number 3. Eugene Britt Nothing is really known about Britt's early life. Back in 1985, in a few months period, Britt committed many crimes against women in the Gary area in Indiana. Britt's first victim was a girl walking on Clay Street in Gary on May 9, 1985. Britt grabbed her from behind and threw her to the ground and choked her until she went unconscious. He then raped her and went through her purse and told her that he had her address, book, and photos. He said he'll remember her face and will kill her if he heard anything about the rape. She told her mom anyways when she got back home and she was taken to the hospital. Britt's DNA matched the samples collected from her, but he wasn't caught until a few months later after murdering and raping multiple victims. Burr was arrested on August 22, 1985 for the murder of Sarah Paulson, age 8, in Portage. A little after his arrest, he confessed to murdering six people. He later pleaded guilty to murdering Paulson during the trial even though he was mentally ill. In May of 1986, Burr was convicted for the murder of the 8-year-old girl and was sentenced to life in prison plus a consecutive 100 years. On October 7, 2006, Burr was convicted for three more murders. The murdered victims were Nikita Moore, age 14, Tonya Dunlap, age 24, Maxine Walker, age 41, and the rape of a 13-year-old Gary girl. On November 3, 2006, Britt was sentenced to 245 years in prison for those convictions. It was believed that Britt murdered up to as many as 10 victims based off his confession. Number 2. Alton Coleman and Deborah Brown Alton Coleman was born on November 6, 1955 in a Waukegan, Illinois ghetto neighborhood, being the middle child of three boys and two girls. Around that time Alton was born, his mother was 14 years old and was a known prostitute. Alton's mother also showed no interest in him when he was born and sent him off to his grandmother, Alma Hosea. He was often teased in grade school for peeing his pants, nicknamed Pissy by his classmates because of his tendency to wet his pants often. He dropped out of grade school and began working part-time at a kitchen in a local veteran's hospital. As he grew up, he acquired a new nickname, Big Al, because he ran alongside gangs racketing up a nifty rap sheet. He was known to carry a knife and had a hair trigger temper. Deborah Brown was born on November 11, 1962. She was described as intellectually disabled, possibly due to head trauma suffered as a child. While at an early age of 21, she was involved in a master-slave relationship with Alton Coleman due to her dependent personality disorder. Deborah was engaged to another person when she met Coleman and started their first crime together. They killed 9-year-old Vernita Wheat from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Coleman knew Vernita through her mother, Juanita Wheat. Her body was found almost a month later near an abandoned building by Coleman's grandmother's apartment. Investigators determined her to have been raped and the cause of death was ligature strangulation. Their next victims were 7-year-old Tamika and her 9-year-old niece, Annie. Coleman and Brown tracked down both kids when they were leaving a candy store. They convinced them both to walk to the woods to play a game. Once they arrived, Brown and Coleman removed Tamika's shirt and tore it into small strips which they used to bind and gag both children. They stomped on Tamika's chest and forced her a short distance away. Annie was forced to perform oral sex on both Brown and Coleman. Coleman then proceeded to rape her and choke her unconscious. When she awoke, they were gone. She found Tamika's dead body in the bushes nearby, strangled with an elastic strip of a bedsheet. The same fabric was found later in an apartment shared by Coleman and Brown. Annie received cuts so deep that her intestines were protruding into her vagina. The day they found Tamika's body, Coleman befriended Donna Williams in Gary, Indiana. On July 1983, her body was found badly decomposed in Detroit, about half a mile from where her car was found with ligature strangulation marks around her neck. Soon after, they entered the home of Mr. and Mrs. Palmer Jones of Dearborn Heights, Michigan, where they were beaten severely. They ripped the telephone pole from their wall before stealing their money and car. 
They moved out to Ohio, where Coleman befriended Virginia Temple, the mother of several children. They found Virginia and her eldest daughter's body. They were found under a crawl space with strangulation marks on their neck. They found one of the children's bracelets in Cincinnati under the body of Tawny Story. The same morning of the previous murders of Virginia and Rochelle, Coleman and Brown robbed Frank and Dorothy Duvendack. They bound the couple with phone cords, which had been cut. The couple stole their car, money, and one of Dorothy's watches, which was found under another victim. Later, that same day, they stayed with some friends and accompanied them to a religious service. Coleman and Brown were later dropped off in downtown Cincinnati. By that time, Coleman had come to the attention of the FBI, which they added him to a top 10 most wanted list as a special edition. Coleman was just the 10th person since initiation of the list in 1950 to merit inclusion in such a manner. Coleman and Brown bicycled into Norwood on July 13th and left with Harry Walter's car soon after assaulting Harry and his wife. Both were found in their own basement. Harry was found unconscious from a blow to the back of his skull. They say pieces of his skull hit his brain and his wife had been raped and beaten to death. Both were bounded with electrical cords while his wife was under a bloody sheet. She was found with her head bludgeoned approximately 20 to 25 times with 12 lacerations which were made with a pair of locking pliers. The back of her skull and her brain were missing. There was blood everywhere in the house, and Coleman's fingerprints were found in the living room, while two prints of two different shoes were in the basement. Two days later, Walter's car was found abandoned in Kentucky where they had kidnapped Olean Carmichael, a college professor from Williamsburg. They drove back to the home of Reverend and Mrs. Gay in Dayton after abandoning Olean in the car. Reverend knew at this time Coleman was on FBI's Most Wanted. Coleman and Brown said they weren't going to kill them and stole their car and headed back to Illinois. Along the way, they stole another car in Indianapolis and killed its owner, 75-year-old Eugene Scott. Three days later, Coleman and Brown were arrested in Evanston. They were spotted by a man who recognized them. He drove to a gas station and reported them to the police. They found both Coleman and Brown with weapons upon arrest during a strip search. They found a steak knife on Coleman and a gun on Brown. Both were sentenced to death. Brown died first, while Coleman's appeal left him on death row until 2002 when he was finally sentenced to death. Number 1. Herbert Baumeister, aka the I-70 Strangler Baumeister was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 7, 1947, being the oldest of four children. His childhood was reported normal, but by the time he was in his pre-teens, he developed antisocial behavior. People that knew him reported that he would play with dead animals and urinating on the teacher's desk. By the time he was a teen, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia but didn't get any further psychiatric treatment. In 1965, he attended Indiana University but dropped out after a semester and later returned in 1967. In November of 1971, he married Juliana Sater and she had three kids with him. As a young adult, he went through a series of jobs being noticed with a strong worth ethic. He was also known to have more bizarre behaviors when he got older. In the 1970s, he was committed to a psychiatric hospital by his father and he told his wife that he needed help. His first arrest was in September of 1985, barely serving any time after being charged with a hit and run while driving drunk. Six months later, Baumeister was charged with stealing a friend's car and conspiracy to commit theft, but he managed to slip by those charges as well. After that, he had a job with a thrift store he didn't like at first, but later found out as a potential money maker. Over the next three years, he focused on learning the business side of things. In 1988, he and his wife founded a successful Save-A-Lot thrift store chain after borrowing $4,000 from his mother. This store was not affiliated with the Save-A-Lot grocery stores. They would usually stock their store with gently used quality clothing, furniture, and other used items. The store quickly grew popular and did so well in the first year that they decided to open up a second store. During the late 80s and 90s, he spent a lot of time in gay bars in Indianapolis. It was alleged that during that time he would bring men back to his mansion from gay bars. Baumeister would strangle him to death or torture him afterwards. He would then dispose him in the woods or near his home. Baumeister's murder started in 1989 and went on into the mid-1990s. 
In 1991, the Baumeister family moved to the dream home, which was an 18-acre horse ranch called the Fox Hollow Farms. The home was in an upscale Westfield area located just outside of Indianapolis in Hamilton County, Indiana. Their Save-A-Lot stores had a reputation for being clean and organized, but it could be said the opposite at their new home. Inside the home is very messy, the outside is overgrown with weeds, and the only area Baumeister kept clean was the pool house. His wife and his three kids would stay with Herbert's mother at her home because of the mess. Baumeister would always stay behind for running the store or some other excuse that he would tell his wife so he could stay out late. Not long after the second store opened, the business started to lose money and it never stopped. Baumeister would start drinking during the day and he would go to the store acting belligerent to the customers and employees. Both stores went from clean and organized to looking like a dump. In 1994, Baumeister's 13-year-old son Eric was playing in the woods behind their home when he found a human skull that was partially buried. The son showed it to his mother Juliana who then showed it to Herbert asking questions about it. Herbert replied saying he had used skeletons in his research and after finding it while cleaning in his garage he took it out in the backyard to bury it. Surprisingly, Juliana believed her husband's strange answer. Juliana would worry all the time as the bills were piling up and her husband would act stranger every day. While the Baumeisters were busy fixing their failing business and marriage, there was a major murder investigation going on in Indianapolis for the disappearances of gay men in the early 1990s. Virgil Vandegrift was a professional private investigator on the case and he would work with investigator Mary Wilson with the Indianapolis Police Department. In 1993, they were contacted by a man claiming that a gay bar patron calling himself Smart Brian had murdered his friend and attempted to murder him. In November of 1995, he called them again, giving a description of the suspect's license plate. Later, investigators discovered that Brian Smart was Herbert Baumeister. Wilson approached Herbert, telling him he was a suspect in the disappearances and asked to search his home. He and his wife refused the search during that time. By June of 1996, Juliana consented to search after being frightened by her husband's behavior after filing a divorce. The search happened while he was on vacation and they discovered the remains of 11 men with only 4 being identified. In a matter of days, 5,500 bones and teeth were found around the home. The 4 victims that were identified were Roger Goodlett, age 34, Stephen Hale, age 26, Richard Hamilton, age 20, and Manuel Resendez, age 31. When the news was broadcasted of the bones being uncovered, Baumeister was already vanished. On July 3rd, Herbert's body was discovered inside his car, which was an apparent suicide. Herbert had shot himself in the head while parked in Pinery Park in Ontario, Canada. He wrote a three-page suicide note explaining he took his life due to his failing marriage and business. Herbert never mentioned in his suicide note of the many murdered victims scattered in his backyard. His wife Juliana helped the investigators of the Ohio murders linking Herbert to the I-70 murders. Receipts provided by Juliana showed that Herbert had traveled along I-70 during the times that the bodies were found dumped along the interstate. Herbert was linked to those victims because the bodies stopped showing up along the interstate at the same time when he moved to his Fox Hollow Farms home. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'd greatly appreciate it if you slam the like button, subscribe, and share the video. If you can, can you also click the bell below the video on the right side because it will notify you when a new video is out on my channel. Next day on our list is Iowa, so stay tuned and I'll see you next time.